I think in many countries we see the right wing populists and right and the right wing uh, do very well in elections and, and going forward. Uh, the latest was in uh, was in the Austrian election. I think it was last Sunday, where the so-called Freedom Party, the FPÖ, uh, actually got 27 percent of the votes. Uh, and I think. Uh, we have had Marine Le Pen, we have had Trump, we have had many, many right-wing populist movements and parties and people, Trump, uh, doing, uh, doing very well in the latest period. Um, and I think, and also we see in general that governments are moving right. One government after the other at the moment uh, are, um, how do you say that, are, are deciding on burk, so-called burka bans. You cannot wear what you want to wear. In, one, in Denmark, they're discussing it now, and I know in many other countries, they're discussing this. So all these attacks on immigrants, on uh, refugees. So we see what can, if you look at the surface of politics, it can seem like uh, there is a shift to the right in many, many countries. And I think that this has gotten a lot of people a lot of young people especially, very worried, and in good reason, I think. I think it's a healthy thing to be disgusted and worried about this, uh, this development and, uh, uh, and, uh, and this trend. Uh, and also we have seen a rise in hate crimes, racism, and, and all this. Um, and we saw the demonstration in, in Charlottesville, where actually an activist, an, an uh, uh, anti-racist activist, was, was murdered. So there are many incidents that get uh, people uh, concerned and also get, get them to think, what is this phenomena? What is this right-wing populism? What is this uh, far-right uh, phenomena? And very indignant also. What we also see is that on the left wing, there is a tendency to, to when you see these phenomena, to cry fascism. Uh, all the time, every time someone stands up saying something racist or something right-wing, uh, people immediately shout uh, fascist at this person. Now, I know the Cliffites in Denmark, for example, at the French presidential election, they, they had a headline in their article saying, the choice is between the banker and the fascist, that is between Macron and, and Le Pen. Uh, and of course, there, I can understand the need to just call something that is racist and not very nice, just something very bad, like fascist. But it, it has become, in this way, it becomes more or less meaningless, and it just becomes like a swear word. And in my opinion, not understanding what is fascism and just using it uh, about everything that is right-wing and reactionary actually, uh, first of all, makes people confused and also confuse ourselves in what is these different phenomena and how do we fight them. And it is very clear we need to fight them, but in order to fight them, we need to understand them. So first of all, in my opinion, we need to understand what is fascism actually. What, what does it scientifically mean? Uh, and, and in a Marxist sense, it's not just a swear word you use against everything and everyone you don't like who are right-wing. It, it actually has a scientific <coughs> meaning. So, I will begin my lead off with uh, actually go into the historical uh, origins of fascism. Uh, and I think this is important in order to understand it and also to understand the situation today and see what are the similarities and also what are the differences and not least what can we learn from the, the, how fascism arose in order to actually combat it and combat the right wing. Um, fascism arose uh, in Italy in the 1920s. Uh, and I will focus on this. I know normally you will focus on Germany, and I think uh, also that is a very important lesson. But uh, I hadn't read, read that much about Italy, and I thought it was very interesting. And also it came before it's, uh, Germany. It's the same processes, but, but in Italy, I would say it is more clear maybe what is actually the essence of, of uh, fascism. Because in Germany you could not get confused, but it is very connected to anti-Semitism. And that is actually one part of, of the Nazi regime, a very important part of course, but it's not the essence. That was more like the German version of fascism and, and anti-Semitism was not a big thing in Italy. There was not a lot of Jews in Italy, so you didn't have to use those as a scapegoat uh, for, uh, for your policies. Uh, Trotsky, he wrote quite a lot analyzing this phenomenon and I really want to uh, encourage the comrades, if they want to know more, to read uh, what, he, what he wrote, especially about Germany. Uh, in, in the 30s. Uh, and what he says is that not all reactionary regimes are fascist. 
that can be military, uh, military Bonapartist dictatorships, there can be all kind of dictatorships, but they're not all fascist just because it is a dictatorship. Um, there are certain historical factors uh, that, that made the triumph of fascism possible, uh, and also that not all racists are fascist either. So you have to, you have to look specifically at, at fascism. And what he says, and I will quote, and I know it can be a bit difficult to follow, so I will try to explain after what, what he means. He says, the fascist movement in Italy was a spontaneous movement of large masses with new leaders from the rank and file. It is a plebeian movement in a region, directed and financed by big capitalist powers. It issued forth from the petty bourgeoisie, the lumpen proletariat, and even to a certain extent from the proletarian masses. Mussolini, a former socialist, is a self-made man arising from this movement. So what is fascism? It is, a ma it is a phenomena based on a social mass base of the petty bourgeoisie especially. So it's not just a, a, a military coup. It, it actually has a social base in society. It's financed by big capital. Uh, and, and the purpose of fascism coming to power is to annihilate physically the labor movement and, the, and, and, and in that way destroy the ability of the workers to move in any way. So, so these are like the three characteristics of a fascist regime. And I think this is very important also to understand today when we talk about uh, fascism and I will co uh, come back to this. Um, and you could say in, in Germany, this was a description of Italy, but, but it very much applies to, to Germany also. Yes, so what actually happened in Italy? Um, after the, the First World War, um, the war had led to a huge development in industry, and therefore also the working class in Italy, uh, and also its organizations, the Socialist Party, that is the Social Democratic Party or Labour Party, uh, and, the, and the trade unions. Um, had grown quite a lot in these years and also in the, in the years just after the war. Of course, as we all know, uh, the war was followed by the, by the Russian Revolution uh, and, and not just the revolution in Russia, but a general revolutionary wave throughout Europe and the world that also affected Italy. Um, there was a big strike wave in, uh, in Italy after the First World War. Uh, in 1919, there were 1,666 strikes. The next year, uh, 1,881,000 strikes. Uh, and and the, these strike waves actually was quite successful. The, the industrial workers uh, got better wages. They got the eight-hour day. They got recognition for the unions, the right to, to negotiate, the, the right to exist uh, the unions, uh, to have collective bargaining and collective contracts. Uh, and, and also they set up factory councils at many of the big factories that the bosses had to accept because they existed and, and what else could they do? So there was a big movement among the workers in Italy and there was also a big movement amongst the peasants. A lot of the peasants in Italy, most of them were, either they didn't have any land at all so they were like a peasant proletariat or they just had a little bit of land so they also had to work. Very few of them actually had enough land to sustain themselves. Uh, and there was a big movement um, uh, in the countryside uh, where the peasants coming back as soldiers from the war saying, we want land. So they occupied it. Uh, and actually the government had to accept this fair, complete, what can you do if the peasants have occupied the land? And say, okay, you can, you can stay on the land for four years, hoping that then the problems would be solved. Uh, and then, uh, but you can, you can keep it if you set up cooperatives and start to organize in these cooperatives in order to try and have some control of, uh, of the peasants. Um, yes, so actually also the agricultural uh, day laborers and the peasants, they form very strong unions, what is known as the Red Leagues, that actually controlled more or less production in the countryside. If you wanted to have work, you had to go through the Red League. They would divide the work so that all workers had something to do. Uh, and, and nobody got unemployed, uh, and everybody shared in the work there was, so, so nobody would go hungry. Um, so the, these leagues and the cooperatives organized more or less everything. And then in 1920, this strike wave among the workers culminated in factory occupations, uh, it, starting uh, among the metal workers. There was a dispute in the metal uh, factories. Uh, the bosses locked out the workers, 
uh, thinking they were clever. But then the workers actually decided to occupy the factories and start running production themselves. And these factory occupations, they spread not just in the north where they began among the metal workers, but to all the metal workers, and it began to spread further out, uh, up to when half a million workers were actually occupying and beginning to, to start production by, their, by themselves. Uh, and also to set up these factory councils, which could be uh, the beginning of setting up some kind of Soviet. So what we had in Italy in 1920 was, uh, was actually a revolutionary situation where the workers were posing the question of power uh, and actually moving in that direction uh, of, of taking power. Um, and also beginning to set up red guards uh, under the control of the factory councils in order to defend themselves. So actually beginning to, to create armed bodies of men connected to these uh, factory councils. The problem was uh, that these factory councils were only local and the leadership of the movement, the CTL, the, the trade union, was a reformist leadership. Uh, and what they, they tried to control the movement and also to keep it within the limits of capitalism. They, uh, they, they tried to make it all the time a question of uh, pay rise and of recognition of workers' uh, right to have a union uh, and to bargain. Instead of taking the, the struggle forward to make it a, a question of, of society and, and the workers taking power, they, they tried to limit it to, those, to these economic uh, trade union uh, demands. Um, and the same thing did the, did the leadership of the Socialist Party. Um, and it is clear if you have a situation where the factories are occupied and the workers are in a, in a, in a struggle and the leadership does nothing, then at some point the, the movement begins to lose momentum. You cannot just keep being isolated factories forever uh, and, 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 and the movement, uh, nothing happens. It has to take a step forward or the movement will begin to die out. It has to be centralized or, or the movement will begin to crumble. And this is what happened in Italy, and I think we have seen many times throughout history, that, that, the, that at a certain point in the movement, if it is not centralized and taken forward by the leadership, which is unfortunately what most often happens, then the workers begin to get demoralized uh, and begin to, to go back uh, one by one, or factory by factory, to, to go back to work and to the normal ways of, uh, of functioning of, of capitalist society. You cannot be in a strike and in a struggle indefinitely. Um, mm. And the, the leaders of the Socialist Party and the trade unions, they, uh, they maneuvered and blamed each other and played with word who was responsible for this movement not going forward. But the, the main thing was none of them wanted to take it forward because the leadership of both of them were reformists, didn't want to break with, with, the, with capitalism, basically. Um, the, the leadership of the, the National Council of the CDL, the, the trade union, declared that the aim of this struggle is to get the bosses to recognize the principle of trade union control over factories. So that, that was their vision. People, the workers were occupying the factory and what they said is, we want to be recognized. <laughs> we want to negotiate with you. But it is clear the power was on the side of the workers. So it was a huge uh, step back uh, in this sense. Um, yes. So, so what, the, what the government did, the government was, was, um, was led by a, a liberal called I'm not very good at Italian, something like Giolitti, I think. He was the prime minister, and he intervened uh, and, uh, and, and, and tried to, to set up this, um, to, to have some kind of compromise, which of course is never a compromise, but it's actually a way of trying to devoiding further struggle, saying we should set up some kind of factory councils, not controlled by the workers, but to have... Um, but to have joint management at the factories. So the bosses have to recognize that the workers should be part of running the factories. And I think everybody who, who knows uh, Northern European countries today know what this means. It means you can be part of uh, deciding who is fired and who is not fired and so on when the class struggle dies down. This is how it always ends because it's in the end, it, under capitalism, it is the bosses who decides. But this was the compromise reached uh, by the mediation of, of the liberal government in Italy. Um, joint trade union and bosses management, it was called. Um, yes. 
the Socialist Party was actually, at this time, which is quite uh, <coughs> astonishing, you could say, was actually a member of the, of the Third International, <laughs> of the Comintern. Uh, but they, and in the leadership in words, were the so-called maximalists, those who in words were revolutionary, but indeed, uh, when it came to it, actually were not prepared to, to take power, but, but hid behind words. Oh, but this is not a true revolutionary movement. We have to wait for the real revolutionary movement to, to begin, and then we can, we can move. We shouldn't do any deals or put forward any partial demands and so on. So in the end, they actually ended up behaving like the reformists, they just had other words uh, when they spoke. Um, the Communist International, uh, the, the, the executive committee, they actually sent out an appeal to the, to the Italian workers. They could see what was going on, sending out an appeal to take power, carry out an armed insurrection, purge the party uh, of the reformists, and set up councils of workers, peasants, soldiers, and sailors. So it is clear that the Communist International could see what is the movement actually about. This is a potentially, uh, this is a revolutionary movement, and it is actually uh, possible for the Italian workers to take power, and this is what should happen. Um, yes, of course, the, the Socialist Party actually had grown from 60,000 in 1918 to 200,000 members. Uh, in 1920, so it is clear it was, it was a party that was reflecting the radicalization in society uh, and was actually, and also if you look at the membership of the union, it was also growing and much bigger. So it was clear that, that there was a possibility of this party uh, actually going in the lead of the working class, but they, they didn't have the right policies or courage or whatever to, to actually carry it through. And it actually ended up in the Socialist Party splitting in January 1921 on the National Congress, where one third of the party then walked out and formed the Communist Party. They also had some problems, and I will get back to that uh, later. But we have Italy, we have this huge movement among the workers, we have this huge, huge movement amongst the peasants, and you can see the big capitalists, the industrialists, and the big landowners being very, very afraid of, of the future and what is going to happen and being afraid of losing everything they have actually, losing their power, losing their privileges. So they, they decide that they have to step up. They are very unfortunately most of the time more ahead, more clear thinking than the, than the workers' leaders. Uh, and in 1919 uh, they formed uh, an alliance to fight against Bolshevism uh, and in 20, they set up the General Federation of Industry, an organization for all of these uh, big industrialists in order to fight against the workers. Uh, and they began to lean on uh, Mussolini's gangs and other gangs that, that were different armed groups in Italy that were fighting the workers. And they began to lean on these. Of course, the, a big industrialist doesn't go out himself and beat up a worker, but he can get people to do it by leaning on them and giving them money and giving them weapons and so on. And this is what, uh, what they began to do in, uh, in Italy. So they both needed the fascists and these gangs in order to combat the workers in a very physical way. And they also began to lean on, these, uh, on the fascists uh, because it's very clear, both if you look at Italy and Germany, that, that both countries come into the scene, the historical scene, quite late in history, when uh, Britain uh, and France and other countries had already colonized most of the world. And it, countries like Italy and Germany, they, they hadn't really had the same share of the cake, you could say. They, they wanted their own colonies, their own markets, their own uh, places to exploit. Uh, and, and therefore, they wanted, uh, the, the industrialists, they wanted a strong government with a very aggressive foreign policy. And you, it's very clear in the case of Hitler that this was a, a strong government with a very ag aggressive foreign policy in order to create room uh, for these newly developing capitalist countries against countries like yeah, Britain and, and, um, and France. So the, the big industrialists, they begin to look at fascism uh, not only as, as something auxiliary, something to just combat the working class, but actually of something, uh, a force that, that could be good to put in power in order to get the house in order, you could say. Um, and yes, they wanted this strong state that could 
directly imposed their will. So you didn't have to have all these negotiations, liberal democracy, these kind of spectacles, but you could actually just have a state to do, uh, to, to further your interest. Um, and especially from 1921, after this workers' struggle that had been defeated and died down, uh, an economic crisis hit Italy. And an economic crisis hits the workers, that's very clear, unemployment rise and so on, but it also hits the capitalists, it hits their profits. And in order for them to keep profits up, they also want a state that can help them in this respect. If, you, if they can have a state that can cut wages, keep the workers down, disband unions, uh, and, uh, and have laws that doesn't say the eight hour working day, for example, uh, then, then it helps them, and also give tax redemptions and all this, uh, it helps to, to prop up profits. So especially from 21, uh, the capitalists in Italy began to look uh, for fascism as a way of solving their problems, you could say, and, and actually solving the problems of a capitalism in a blind alley. Uh, that was the case in, in 21. Uh, yes, so after the war, there were many different anti-labor leagues in Italy. One of them were Mussolini's, uh, they were called Combat Fasci. I think Fasci is, at this point, meant some, some kind of uh, armed gang or something. Um, and there was the war volunteers in something called the Aditi, uh, of, of yeah, people who had fought in the war and who had now been demobilized coming back to Italy, and they were about 20,000 20, armed uh, members. Uh, and, and they became the shock troops of various anti-labor leagues in this struggle uh, against the, the workers. Uh, and what they would do is, if there was a peaceful procession, a demonstration or something of workers in some city, uh, also women, children and so on, they would go in and they would just start attacking with grenades, with knives, with the... If you have 20, 30 armed gangsters, what it basically is, going in in a peaceful demonstration and just starts uh, slashing out at people who, who are, is not expecting this at all. You can create quite a big uh, uh, scare uh, and quite a big mess of it. Uh, and this is what they started to do in different towns uh, and especially in the countryside. Um, in Milan in April 1919, there was a be very big parade that reached close to, to the center that was dispersed. And then the same day, they went into the office of the Socialist Party paper in that city called Avanti uh, and just sacked the place. And this was also more and more common. They just went into the offices of the labor leagues, the unions, uh, the, the Socialist Party and their papers and just smashed everything up and burned down the place and, and beat up everybody who was inside. And, and it doesn't take, how can you say, the workers were many more and much stronger, but they, they were not organized in any kind of defense. It doesn't take that many to start these kind of attacks and this kind of intimidation. If you're determined and if you have a plan and if you're armed, then you can do it quite easily, you can say. Um, yes, and this just continued. Uh, in, in December 1919, the new chamber, uh, the new parliament in Italy opened, and as it, it closed, the socialist uh, deputies, as they left parliament, they were just beaten up by fascist gangs also. Um, yes, and, and soon these uh, different uh, groups uh, fused with the Mussolini gangs, and, uh, and that became like the fascist uh, movement, the beginning of it. And after the factory occupations, because the, uh, the industrialists and the landowners were so scared, they decided to, to send quite a lot of money into the fascist organizations to just fund them uh, with the millions of liras, I guess it was in Italy. Um, yes, and for that, the fascist gangs could buy arms, uh, they could pay the recruits to actually be full-time fascist gangsters. Uh, and, and also to pay ex-officers from the army who enrolled in these fascist uh, groups. So they started in the countryside where people were more isolated, just uh, attacking. Uh, and they, they started um, in Bologna, that was the center of, of these red leagues. Uh, and they went into, um, there had been municipal elections in November 1920. And the Socialist Party had won a big victory. Uh, and at the first session of this new 
council. They, they, a group of fascists went in and just shot uh, crazily. Uh, and actually, it ended up killing uh, actually a, a reactionary councilman. And it, it has never been solved who, who killed him. Uh, and they said at that time it wasn't the fascist. They used, but it's very clear it was the fascist, but they used it as an excuse. Now a reactionary, uh, this right-wing uh, municipal council guy has been killed. So we just started start an offensive against the labor movement. So everything was turned on its head, actually. <laughs> they created the mess, and then they used it as an excuse to just go into the offensive, um, uh, the fascists. Yes, these different action squadrons or punitive uh, groups, uh, also, they, a lot of them were, were headed by the local landowners, the sons of the local landowners, uh, just going into these, uh, yeah, into these groups in order to, to use them also against the, the, the workers um, in, the, in the countryside. They had cars, they had... Uh, uh, vans to be driven around uh, to different areas uh, and to help each other to attack uh, these workers that, that lived uh, different places. Yes, these groups, uh, even though it was not official, they were helped by the state, by the police, the military, and uh, some kind of, diff I think it's a mix maybe, called Carabinieri or something like that, uh, some kind of Italian police armed force, I think. Uh, the police helped them by recruiting people to, to these fascist gangs. They helped them by uh, giving permits for arms for the fascist groups and revoking uh, arms permits for, for the labor organizations. Um, they remained passive if there were any fascist attack. They only went in if the fascists were in problems uh, to help them. Uh, and also the army, uh, the general Badoglio, he was chief of staff, he sent out a confidential circular to the officers saying, if you enroll in the fascist organizations, you can keep getting four-fifth of your pay. And this were, this were men coming back from the war, uh, having nothing to do, and obviously uh, used to fighting. So they could keep getting part of most of their pay if they enrolled in these, uh, these fascist organizations. Uh, and also giving uh, munition from the state arsenals and so on. Yes, so they began to occupy different regions by thousands of, uh, of armed men. The liberals who were in power uh, in Italy, uh, so-called Democrats, they thought it's a good idea to lean on the fascists in order to smash the workers. Uh, so when we have smashed the workers, then we can take on the fascists. That, that was their clever idea. Uh, and then they would end up as the masters of, of the country. Uh, and in the spring of 21, parliament was dissolved, preparing for new elections, and they set up a national, uh, a national bloc, including the fascists. Different bourgeois parties stood on the same platform in the election, and this helped the fascists to get their first MPs. And the fascists got elected uh, 30 MPs in this election with the help of the liberals, uh, because they hoped then to get the labor movement to, uh, to, to be crushed in this, uh, in this move. Um, it was very clear that it was not the intention of Mussolini or the fascists to, to be just succumbed by the liberals. It was their intention to take power or, or to get into power some, some, some way or the other. Mussolini was, was uh, now there are thousands of, uh, of fascists armed and they want something to happen. It's clear you also though they can be in a constant, um, how can you say, mobilization. Also, for, for this psychology, you also have to move forward. And there was a huge pressure from below in the fascist organization in order to take step forward. Uh, one thing is just to smash up, uh, up uh, workers, but also you need to, now you, you have Mussolini talking about power. He also had to do something. And he began to mobilize uh, these uh, different fascist gangs. Uh, 50,000, I think, in Milan gathered uh, on this, in, in the wake of the so-called March on Rome. But actually, and I think this is, uh, uh, it's very often portrayed as they got into power in some kind of coup. But actually, uh, Mussolini, uh, he had these men, but he, he wanted to, to get into power in a more parliamentary fashion. And I think that is something that is good to remember, that 
just because you have democracy on paper, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, that it, it is not, how can you say that, it's not a um, vaccination against fascists coming to power. Hitler also came to power uh, democratically, you could say. Um, yes, what he did was, um, there was these fascist gangs gathering. There were occupations in different regions. Uh, and and uh, the, the government now could see there might be a threat that they would be overthrown. So, so the prime minister, he called a, a state of siege. But the king didn't want to sign it. The king, he plays a very helpful role of the fascists in, in all this. He didn't want to sign it. So there was complete confusion. And the police didn't know what to do. So they just let the fascists do what they wanted. And in the end, the king summoned Mussolini to Rome in order to settle down everything in order for him to, to form a government. This is a guy with 30 members of parliament. Out of, uh, there were several hundred parliamentarians in the, in the Italian uh, parliament. But the king, he says, no, what we should do is, co is summon Mussolini to form a new government. And, this is the, and he accepted. And then after he had taken power in parliament, he summoned these 50,000 by train. Very heroic march on Rome. They had already gotten power by the king, and then they are driven in by train, and then they can march through Rome and, and seem very impressive in some way. But this is actually what happens. In the beginning, he had to threat carefully because the workers' organizations were still in existence in, in Germany. Uh, so what he did was to have uh, an absolute majority, he passed a new ele electoral law uh, saying in 23 that if uh, a party got a majority in the elections if, and if they got 25% of the vote, they would have two-thirds of all votes in parliament. That is a very clever law to do. You just need to get 25% of the votes. Then he called an election. They completely intimidated uh, everybody who went to vote. They got 25% of the, of the votes. And then they had two thirds in parliament at Kuhn, at Kuhn start running by decree. So, so he didn't do anything illegal from a bourgeois democratic sense, uh, but uh, that was a way of him uh, obtaining uh, absolute power. Uh, and then he, he could begin. Uh, 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 mm, mm. Yeah, he began to introduce emergency laws, he began to uh, ban strikes, uh, suppress all liberties, uh, and, and governing uh, by decree. And in 25 and 26, all parties except the fascists were dissolved. Um, and what they then had to do was to try and destroy the unions because the unions had been smashed up by the, by the fascists, uh, in, especially in the countryside, but they were not eradicated. And in order to really slash the conditions of the workers, you have to eradicate uh, completely any trace of organizations of, of the workers. So, so what they did was, first of all, uh, creating fascist unions and pushing people into them. Uh, I, I don't have that much time, so if anybody wants to know how, uh, I can explain that in the sum up. But what they did was basically saying, you don't get a job, you don't get to eat if you don't join a fascist union. That is a very compelling uh, uh, way of getting people into your organization. Um, and also, uh, they began to, uh, yeah, to suppress the industrial unions. But actually, they never managed to get support among the workers. There were elections to these factory councils in the beginning, and they never got a lot of votes. And the same is, is true in, in Germany, Hitler's Germany. When Hitler had come to power in 1933, uh, in there were elections to the factory councils, and it, the Nazis got 3% of the votes. And I think this is important to, to understand, because there is a myth that all Germans, all German workers or all Italians, they supported the Nazis or the fascists. And this is not true. And if you look at the, at, at the figures, it's, it's very clear that this was not the case. The problem in these countries were the leadership of the unions and of the, of the labor organizations, the, the Socialist Party and the Communist Party. And, and this is what I want to say a bit about also, because this is the main thing, I think. What did the, what did the workers' organizations do? You can only fight back, especially at an enemy like fascism, in an organized, centralized way. What did they do? The Socialist Party, first of all, they could have won the middle layers. The peasants were voting for the Socialists, or supporting them at least, and especially in the factory occupations. 
But the, but the program of the socialists will not give the land to the peasants, like the Bolsheviks in Russia in 1917. It was to warn the peasants that if the socialists came to power, they would <laughs> take the land. That is not a very good way to win over <laughs> this whole uh, very big group of, of uh, peasants, the petty bourgeoisie. Uh, and what also happened was that they completely dis how do you say that they completely left the workers on their own when there was this revolutionary wave in 1920. Mussolini he said about the socialists, and I think, uh, and he knows them very well because he was a socialist until 1914. He said they did not know how to profit from a revolutionary situation such as history does not repeat. And that was actually the basis of him coming to power. Um, the youth and, and the war veterans, many of them supporting fascists, if there had been a strong lead from the labor movement in a revolutionary direction, they could also have been won over to the working class in order to change society because what they were looking for was something else, something different, a, a way of changing society. But the problem was that the labor leaders didn't give them any uh, lead in this direction. They just kept uh, getting into deals with, with the liberals and the government in order to solve, to try and find some negotiated uh, deal. In 1921, on 3rd of August, the Socialist Party signed a peace deal, it was actually called a peace deal with the fascist, brokered by the liberal government, to say we, we agree to not attacking each other. So the Socialist Party signed it and Mussolini signed it. Uh, and then uh, Mussolini used it. I, the Socialists said, okay, now we are fine. We will not be attacked anymore. This is after the fascists have smashed up their offices. But Mussolini used it in order to strengthen his organization denounce the deal in November and just go even further into the offensive. And now the Socialist Party had completely created illusions in, in this way of, uh, of combating. Um, actually, uh, Turadi, one of the leaders of the Socialist Party, I think, he said, one must have the manhood to be a coward. This was, their, this was their way of fighting. Oh, we shouldn't upset, we shouldn't provoke the fascists. We should keep the public opinion on our side. So, so, we, so we, the best thing to do is not to fight. It will, it will pass. He will never come to power. We just have to wait, be the responsible party, uh, and then problems will be solved, and then it will be our turn. This, this was their thinking. Um, the workers were actually trying to fight back. They were setting up uh, different uh, anti-fascist militias called the Adici del Popolo uh, in order to, to arm themselves and fight back. Uh, but, but both the Socialist Party and the trade unions were very hostile towards this because they had this idea of not fighting back. But also this new Communist Party which you might excuse because they, it was a very new party, but they also they had a very sectarian attitude towards these, uh, these uh, anti-fascist uh, uh, groups. What they said was, this is not communist-led groups because they consisted of all kinds of political uh, tendencies, uh, and there are many who are not class conscious enough, so we cannot go into them. So they pulled out the communists in order to, to create their own uh, groups uh, to defend, uh, to attack the fascists. The problem was they were not strong enough, so they didn't really do anything. If they had actually uh, given a, a real revolutionary lead to these anti-fascist groups, they could actually have fought back against the fascists and might have won, uh, very possibly, if they had had the right uh, policy. Instead, they withdrew in a very sectarian way. And, and you can see uh, the same process going on in, in Germany. I won't go into that because I don't have that much time. Um, yes, but actually you can see uh, the communists having, it was later, it was in, in the 30s, having this third period uh, theory of, of the biggest enemy is the social democrats. They're social fascists. So before we fight against fascism, we, f we fight against the social democrats. And actually joining up with the, with the Nazis to, to attack meeting of social democratic workers and beat them up uh, in, a, in a completely crazy manner, of course. And then when they realized the danger, it was too late uh, and, and Hitler had come to power. So what is fascism, to sum up? 
you can say World War I was a sign of a capitalist system in decline. And it's a way of the capitalists to overcome the problems in their own system, you can say. Uh, and, and one of the other signs of a, of a system in an impasse is the, is the workers going on to the offensive. Uh, and I think this is a very important thing, and I will get back to it, uh, that, that what you see first when a system goes into a decline and into an impasse is the workers reacting and fighting back in order to, to create a better life. And then if that doesn't succeed, on the back of that, fascism can come into power. Um, Trotsky has said, fascism is the chemically pure distillation of the culture of imperialism. Uh, and when I was, I, I saw a lot of uh, articles uh, we have written, and I have read this many times, and I ha really had to think about what does it actually mean, it's the pure essence of imperialism. Uh, it's something that is very easy to say, but what is it actually? Uh, but when I think about it, as I see it, it is really this, it is finance capital not, not being able to find a way out of the internal contradictions of its own system and trying to solve it by just applying power uh, in order to further its interests, uh, both internally against the workers and externally in order to create uh, uh, markets and, and uh, for, for, its, uh, for its production. So, so this is like the pure, pure essence of imperialist policies in, in a system that, is, that, that can see no way out. Um, so if you look at the situation now, uh, this is the final part, and I think this is important, but I thought, I thought it was necessary to have this historical uh, explanation first, because fascism is something we say very often, but what does it actually mean and, and what can we use it for today? What we see now is a system in decline, in many ways similar to the situation in, 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 in the 30s and the, in the 20s and the 30s. Uh, a system in decline, a system in a blind alley, the capitalists can find no way out uh, in any way. We have these insolvable contradictions. So there are many similarities, but still I would argue that that's, that doesn't mean, like many on the left wing thinks or says, that fascism is on the agenda in the immediate future, not in any way. That is not to say that we don't see the rise of, of the right wing and also of the far right wing and that we need to, to fight it. What we see is that, that the whole political system that we know it crumbles also like we saw in the 20s. The, the political center begins to disintegrate. We see all the old parties who used to switch have being in government, the Social Democrats or the Liberals or whatever they're called, and the Tories or Labour or whatever, they, they can't form governments. In some places, they can't even form, form governments together anymore, like in Austria, uh, because they are, they, when they come into power, they get discredited because they all have to carry out the same policies, the necessary policies, that is, uh, within the limits of a capitalism in crisis, that it is cuts and cuts and cuts, and they can do nothing else. And I think that is also why they call all these other groups populists. That is because they think, uh, people like Trump, but also on the left wing, these are people who say something that are popular, that resounds among the, the population. And the old traditional parties, they can't do that because they know they have to do what is necessary for the system. And that is only one way, and that is austerity. The, the problem is they can't solve these internal contradictions in any way. So, so what we see is a political polarization to both sides. Uh, and people are looking for something else. And that is why we see all these anti-establishment phenomena rising. People are just sick and tired of, of status quo and, and the establishment, what is. Uh, and I think we should, there are many on the Danish left wing at least, that are very sad about this, saying there are no trust in politics anymore. Uh, the social cohesion in society is being undermined. They're really trying to put back trust in democracy. But in my opinion, it's a very good thing that people do not trust this system or beginning not to trust this system to solve their problems. That they're beginning to see that this system cannot work and we need something else. The problem is if there's only the right wing to say this, people will go that way. But, but the potential is there for, for polarization and for people going to the left wing. Um, 
Yes, so, so the social basis now uh, for this right-wing populism being going forward is a system in an impasse and in, in decline. Uh, yes, so what these right-wing right populist groups are, they base themselves on, especially I would say, the, the failure of the reformist uh, leaderships in the labor movement to do anything about the problems of, of the working people and, and for, for people in general. In, in Denmark, the, the Danish People's Party, that is a bit like the Freedom Party in, in Austria, it's a, it's a right-wing populist party, they, they began to really go forward in the 90s. We had a social democratic government. They said, it has never been as good as it is now. Uh, and that was not how people felt it. Then comes someone along saying, there are problems. We recognize people have problems. We also know what the, what the problem is. It's immigrants. We, we know who to blame. Uh, and, and nobody else said there were problems. And now even the social democrats are saying, uh, yes, we have problems and the problems are the immigrants. They're competing with the Danish People's Party. So, so where should people look? But it is very clear that places where there is a left-wing anti-establishment alternative, that these right-wing um, populist groups, uh, that most of those who support them can be won over to left-wing alternatives. Uh, you see it in Britain, for example. UKIP is nothing anymore. Uh, now we have Jeremy Corbyn uh, <laughs> winning big time. Uh, among, I would, I would guess, many people who, who formerly would have voted or supported uh, UKIP. Um, also, I know there was a, an opinion poll some years ago among UKIP voters, and most of them said, yeah, we want an NHS on public hands. Yes, we want a nationalization of the energy companies. And it's clear these right-wing uh, uh, populists, they will never give it, but most of them has never been tested. So, so that is also why they can win, um, win votes. So what we see now, we see these right-wing populists, but they should not be mistaken for fascists. They have, some of these groups have fascist elements in them, and we also see in some countries actual, actual fascist groups growing and going forward, but they're still very, very small. Why do I say that fascism in, is not on the agenda right now? The social base for fascism is completely different now than it was in the 30s and the 20s. Um, if you look at the number of self-employed, including peasants, uh, it is, in France, it was, it was 9% in 2010. Germany now it's 12%. The average in the EU is 17.3%. The peasantry and, and this social base, the petty bourgeoisie, is completely uh, being um, soaked up, you could say, into the proletariat in, in the years since, uh, since before the Second World War. So the social base is, mu is much smaller. And that means they can't just go into this, uh, into this direction, into this solution. Also, they learn from the last time. One thing is to put uh, some strong man in power uh, to, to put up, to uh, safeguard their interest. But they couldn't control neither Hitler or Mussolini. So in the end, they ended up provoking mass uh, movements uh, and not really uh, serving the interest of big capital. So they would have to think very strongly again. Then we have other layers, like the middle layers, like doctors, uh, teachers, and so on. Uh, earlier, they were like privileged layers that also could be won to fascism. Today, they're proletarianized. Uh, in, in Italy, in the 20s, it, it was the students also who supported fascism. Today, the students are moving left. They're not a social base either. Um, yes. So, so, so therefore, and, and and I think most importantly, what, what is on the agenda now is a system in impasse, and it is like in the 20s uh, and also the 30s, it is pushing the working class to move. And it is pushing the working class to move and to be able to attract also the middle layers. What was the problem in Italy and in Germany in the 20s and the 30s? It was the lack of leadership from the workers' movement from, from those who were supposed to lead the fight for a better world, they completely capitulated uh, when the struggle actually came. So the best way to make, uh, and the fascists couldn't get into power until after the workers had been completely uh, defeated. So, so if we say, what is on the agenda now? It is the workers moving to change their lives. 
what is, what is the sole thing we can do in order to make this successful? The sole thing we can do is to build an organization that is actually uh, able to lead this movement to success and not into defeat. And this will be on the agenda in the next period. Of course, there will be, I think, a rise in the far right and attacks and hate crimes, and we should fight against this. We should, if necessary, uh, put up groups to protect uh, demonstrations like in Charlottesville and so on. But the main struggle is a political struggle in order to create a leadership of the labor movement that is actually capable of carrying out the task of changing society uh, in a better way. Um, and I think this, uh, this is, I have to sum up, <laughs> I have been told, I think there are many things you could go into about the right wing now, but I think this is the main lesson. There are those on the left wing who are so preoccupied with going out fighting fascists, uh, but the main way building a revolutionary organization and mobilizing on a mass scale. I know it was done in, in Sweden. There has been mass demonstrations against the fascists. Uh, it was done in, uh, in the US. And I think this is, there are people on the left wing who, who think everything is black. But what they don't see is, yes, we have far right groups coming up, but we have much, much bigger uh, demonstrations against the far right. When Trump was elected, there were massive demonstrations. And uh, when the far right tried to demonstrate in uh, San Francisco, uh, there were huge mobilizations. The dark workers said they would strike and, and the right wing had to cancel their demonstration. Uh, in France, in one of the regions where Front National had gotten uh, many votes in, in the previous elections, when there was this movement in the spring, they were nowhere to be seen because they have no role to play in mass movements. So this is how, what we should aim for uh, and, and learn from, the, from Italy. No trust in the state in fighting fascism, no trust in the liberals, only trust in the working class uh, that it will move and that it will be able to take power if we are able to build the necessary forces to make this uh, a success. Thank you. <laughs>